Well, welcome to the 700 Club. Colossal chaos in Kabul. Afghanistan's president is long gone, and now thousands of civilians are scrambling to flee the capital. The conquering Taliban are, quote, holding court and broadcasting from the president's palace. The American embassy has been cleared out, and the U.S. military is struggling to manage a massive evacuation. So why is President Biden silent in the midst of the epic disaster he created? Coming up, we'll talk with former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. But first, here's Dale Hurd with an update on the escalating mayhem. Chaos in the Afghan capital of Kabul as thousands of frantic civilians afraid for their lives under Taliban rule desperately try to escape. As panicked Afghans clambered onto planes, U.S. soldiers fired warning shots into the air. Hundreds more carried their suitcases as they rushed out of Kabul on foot. This is manifestly not Saigon. But it looks the same, complete with U.S. military helicopters carrying embassy personnel to safety. The U.S. embassy now evacuated. The Taliban broadcasting on live TV from the equivalent of the Oval Office at the presidential palace after rolling into the capital Sunday as the president fled the country. This is something Joe Biden said six weeks ago would never happen. Your own intelligence community has assessed that the Afghan government will likely collapse. That is not true. They did not, they didn't, did not reach that conclusion. There's going to be no circumstance where you see people being lifted off the roof of a embassy. The likelihood there's going to be the Taliban overrunning everything and owning the whole country is highly unlikely. Texas Congressman Michael McCall, the ranking member on the House Foreign Affairs Committee, says Joe Biden blew it on Afghanistan. I think it's, it's an uh, unmitigated disaster of epic proportions. And I think the president, uh, this is going to be a stain on this president and his presidency. And I think he's going to have blood on his hands for what they did. Secretary of State Antony Blinken was in full damage control on the Sunday talk shows, trying to defend the U.S. withdrawal and the chaos that has ensued. The fact of the matter is this. We went to Afghanistan 20 years ago uh, with one mission in mind, and that was to deal with the people who attacked us on 9-11. Uh, and that mission has been successful. The Trump administration initiated the Afghanistan withdrawal, but Republican Congressman Steve Scalise points out that Trump's plan was based on the Taliban meeting certain conditions. In fact, many of the conditions included that the Taliban wouldn't overtake the cities that they have now overtaken under President Biden's leadership. The Taliban have tried to reassure frightened Afghans, but this phone video shows the bodies of people pulled from their homes by Taliban fighters in Kandahar and shot. Thousands of Afghans who helped the U.S. military face a similar fate if they can't be evacuated. Meanwhile, Joe Biden is being criticized for holding himself up at Camp David, away from journalists potentially embarrassing questions about what his critics are calling his foreign policy disaster. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Ladies and gentlemen, there has been a pattern of sellouts by men who ran this country who were in the Democrat Party. In 1945, at Yalta, President Roosevelt gave Stalin control over all of Eastern Europe, which included Poland, East Germany, Hungary, Romania, and others. This plunged these people into helpless dictatorship for decades. Then, President Jimmy Carter facilitated the fall of the Shah of Iran and helped the Ayatollah Khomeini's takeover of Iran by militant Islam. Carter also gave the Panama Canal to Manuel Nor Noriega and placed the dictator Robert Mugabe in charge of Zimbabwe. President Obama did not recognize the state of Iraqi's troops. By not achieving a status of forces agreement, he allowed ISIS to take over Iraq and begin to build what they called the Caliphate. And here at home, folks, in Democrat-controlled cities across America, there's been a concerted effort to defund the police. And now crime is rampant in Portland, Seattle, Chicago, and New York, just to name a few. 
And we add to this the chaos at our southern border under Biden and the disaster that has unfolded in Afghanistan, where the Taliban has now declared itself the Muslim caliphate of Afghanistan. Well, former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo is joining us now for more. And Mr. Secretary, President Biden is blaming this situation on the agreement you made with the Taliban. What, should, what do you say to that? Well, it's a pretty pathetic effort to shift blame. The responsibility for what's happening today in Kabul falls squarely on the leadership, the commander in chief who's there in charge, who made the terrible set of decisions that led to what you're seeing today on television. They decided to pull out the military before they got civilians out. They hadn't adequately planned. And as for the agreement, the, the, the Taliban clearly broke the agreement. And President Trump was unambiguously clear, you break this agreement, we will come break you. We will come inflict enormous costs on you. We're not going to beg you not to come into our embassy. We're going to come to your village and inflict enormous pain on you until you comply with these set of terms that you signed up for. They, one of the key terms was a power-sharing agreement. The Taliban clearly violated this, and instead, of saying, well, you violated the agreement, we're not going to uh, finish our drawdown in Afghanistan. The Biden administration says, nope, we're going to take everybody out without a plan, without a systemic thought as to how we're actually going to deal with this result. History will prove the Trump administration had drawn down safely and securely. We had around 2,500 U.S. forces, about 5,000 NATO forces on the ground when we departed. President Trump was very clear to me and to the Department of Defense that we were going to make sure that this was an orderly plan to withdraw that protected the important American interest of making sure that we were never attacked from this place again. And the Biden administration has now pulled the pin, right? They pulled the last stick out of the Jenga puzzle. The chaos is ensued. We can't even get the president of the United States today to explain why it is he allowed this to happen. Uh, we understand that the uh, Taliban has taken over an enormous amount of armament that they have drones, they have the Bagram airfield, they got other things. Uh, could you tell us what extent did the material we left behind? So I can't tell you for sure because I don't know precisely what they left behind. I, I can certainly talk to this in great detail. I was in the room for meetings over the course of my entire four years where we talked about this very set of operations, how we were thinking about this. President Trump was clear. If they scare an American, if they hurt an American, we're going to impose all or these all American power to impose real costs on the Taliban. We want a peaceful, reconciled Afghanistan so that we can depart in an orderly way and protect the things that matter to the United States. A key piece of this, a key piece of this was to make sure that we got all of our equipment out. President Trump, I can't tell you how many times he looked at the military leadership and said, I want every stick of American equipment out of there. I want I want it all. And then when we get that, when we get to that place, take the time that you need to do that. When we get to that place, then we can continue to reduce our force posture there. I don't know what all they left behind. I hope they left, left it behind in the condition that the Taliban cannot use it against either the Afghan people or against Americans. I fear that that's not the case. Uh, let me ask you, what's this going to do to uh, our policy with Iran, China, Russia? How will they regard us now? Yeah. You know, we've talked about the tactical situation on the ground. Uh, it's worth one more thought. I must say to all the folks who fought there, all the young men and women who risked their lives, some who lost family members or injured there, your fight was noble, the work was good, the destruction of Al Qaeda was complete and important, and we did good work there. So this was a political failure, not a failure of our young men and women who were fighting for us. And I mentioned that in the context of what's going on around the world. I hope the world will see that we still are a very capable fighting force, that our young men and women are entirely capable of doing their mission. I fear that they will now see that American leadership has left the global stage, that we're in retreat, whether it's handing the Russians a pipeline or you mentioned earlier uh, what's going on at our southern border. We saw what the Obama administration did when President Biden was the vice president with Bashar Assad, fired chemical weapons at his own citizens. They refused to impose costs on him. There's a long history of President Biden not demonstrating the strength and resolve and the leadership that we need on the American stage. It's not about starting wars. We went four years without starting a war, and we went the last over 12 months without a single American killed in Afghanistan, in spite of the fact that we drew down over 80% of our soldiers. The, the world is watching President Biden. They're watching America. And when President Biden says America is back, I hope he doesn't mean we're back to the old days of Jimmy Carter. 
that would be a disaster for American foreign policy and frankly, a disaster for global security and peace as well. Thank you. Thank you for the work you're doing. God bless you. Appreciate it so much for being here. Have a good day. Terry, it's interesting what's going on, isn't it? Oh, we live in a world full of lots of chaos. Good thing to know the Prince of Peace at a time like this, isn't it? The Brave. That's the name of an Israeli outreach to widows and orphans. The death of a spouse threatens the stability of a family, leaving a gaping hole for the surviving wife or husband. Once a week, volunteers in Israel supply food and love for these hurting families. As Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem, they're using the Bible as their guide. Once a week, this home is filled with kids playing, parents meeting, and volunteers helping. It's called Amitzim, which in Hebrew means the brave. The goal of Amitzim is to fulfill the biblical mandate found in the scriptures to embrace and strengthen the widows and orphans. About 12,000 families in Israel have suffered the death of a parent. What we do here is what God said in, in Exodus 22. Listen, hear the voice of the orphan and the widow. And God says, I hear their voice. You listen to their voice. And this is our obligation. Hadas Glick began this effort several years ago. Her husband died in 2001 from a stroke. Yehuda's wife died in 2018. And later he and Hadas married. Now this former widow and widower reach out to these families in need. We understand how strong of a power and, and, and that effect a father means to his children, a mother means for her children, and so we come to give a hand and to strengthen, but not to replace. Netanel has been a widower for three and a half years. I quickly understood that this was a place where they spoil us. They have, you know, good fruit and food cut out for us. We don't have to work because we're on 24-7 when you're raising three children on your own. You don't really get any time to rest. And I could sit down and my kids wouldn't be on top of me as they are all the time. It was a place where I could rest. And then I found that it wasn't just a place where I could rest, it was a place where I could be amongst peers, amongst people that have had a similar experience to mine, which provides a sort of safety. My husband passed away two years ago. We have two daughters, one eight and one six years old. We got to know the Amit Seam Club. It's really good for us here. They take care of us. They provide for us. It's really encouraging that there is a group of widows and widowers here that together, once a week, help each other. I'm really happy that I met Yehuda and Hadas. They are, for me, simply amazing people. Trained volunteers serve hot meals and love. They open the heart. <laughs> They come to open the heart, they come to get warm from, from us, from the, all the volunteers here. We come every Wednesday, meet the people, we know them, we know their names. We ask if they are not coming, they surprise if we call, why didn't you come last week? Oh, this week I will come, I will come this week. And they are very happy from this place. 13 year old Hila lost her mother two years ago to cancer. For her and her dog Louie, it's a safe place. It's nice to be in the company of equals. And what's your favorite activity here? The chatting. It helps the people here that Hadass and Yehuda clearly know the devastating loss of a spouse. When we see these orphans and widows, and I just sit around and talk to them, they're alone, nobody remembers them. And here is somebody who's caring for them and remembering them, and it gives them strength. You can't believe. Then they go back home and they're like a new person. We realize that when you don't have a father or you don't have a, a mother, the home needs support. What we're doing here is making a new concept, rebuilding the Torah words into reality. Into reality. They look to Isaiah the prophet who said, learn to do good, seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. Glick feels the goals of Amit Seem go hand in hand with the Shalom Jerusalem Foundation that he founded. It seeks to build up Jerusalem and increase Jewish access to the Temple Mount. The Bible refers to an orphan, but always says the orphan and the widow. It says when you're celebrating with me your holiday at the temple, 
include the orphan and the widow. When you're bringing your harvest, don't forget to include the orphan and the widow. Hadass and Yehuda hope to establish 10 centers like this one throughout Israel. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Amit Seem Center, Jerusalem. Isn't that marvelous? You know, remember the orphan and the widow. You know, the, uh, our president, Abraham Lincoln, talked about taking care of the widow, the people who born the battle and their widows and orphans. I mean, this is something that is so important. We have here at CBN what's called Orphan's Promise. Terry has done a fantastic job with Orphan's Promise, and we have many, many orphans that are being helped by CBN's Orphan Promise. So let's go to Terry, and she can tell us her next story. Joe Lombardo heard the steel bars slam shut, and then the lock. For the first time in his life, Joe had been thrown in jail. So what was his crime? Trying to protect his prodigal son. And I remember walking past my dad's cell. His head was in his hands, and he was just praying. It was hard for Michael Lombardo to see his dad behind bars, especially since it was Michael's fault he was there. And I remember feeling in my heart, like, you are horrible. The youngest of four, Michael grew up in a close-knit, blue-collar Christian home in New Jersey. For the most part, life was good, until Michael hit his teen years. I got involved with a group of friends, and we were all about drinking, partying, sleeping around. I enjoyed that lifestyle. I was in a punk rock band. We would travel around New Jersey a little bit and play shows. And I was like, I'm just going to dive into that lifestyle. I want nothing to do with this God stuff. Michael often disappeared for days at a time. His parents, Joe and Stephanie, worried. It was very hard. You know, a lot of tears, a lot of sleepless nights. I didn't know where he was. I didn't know. If he was okay or not, I just had to trust God. We had to trust God. I would sit him down and, you know, tell him, hey, what are you doing with yourself here? I know you're high, and, but in one ear and not the other. He wasn't our Michael anymore. Still, they loved and supported their son. His dad even gave him a job at his construction business after high school. But despite the warning signs, Michael wasn't about to stop. As I got a little bit older, 17, 18, 19, things, parties got crazier, the lifestyle got more reckless, and drugs were taking a toll on me physically. And I began to realize, like, hey, this isn't as, as cool and as great as I, as I thought it was. His parents prayed constantly. Stephanie says Psalm 91 brought her comfort. Guardian God for his people Israel. I'd just be, you know, weeping. And then you just have to kind of wipe those tears away and just start speaking the word of God. Just start claiming his promises, you know, and, and, and agreeing with what God sees in Michael. One night, 18-year-old Michael had a car accident near his parents' home and was arrested for drug possession. His dad drove to the scene and tried to help. And they arrested him as well for obstructing justice. And I remember walking past my dad's cell. His head was in his hands, and he was just praying. And I remember feeling in my heart, like, you are horrible. And a lot of guilt, a lot of shame came in. Just kind of like gave it to God and said, Lord, you know, we don't know what to do with him anymore. He's yours. Joe and Michael were released that night, and charges were dropped against Joe. Michael was given probation and a year of community service. But it wasn't until he wrecked another car a couple of years later that Michael started to realize the God he was running from was trying to get his attention. Both times I wasn't wearing a seatbelt, the cars were crushed. And I knew in my, in my heart, in my head, that this was God. The fact that I'm not seriously injured, <laughs> you know, the fact that I didn't die, it was God. Michael knew it was time to change, but it wasn't that simple. I was getting suicidal thoughts, depression hit me, and I just, I tried everything to make myself happy in my own power and abilities. I tried more drugs, I tried more relationship, I plunged myself into my music. Every time I got what I wanted, I was still empty, broken, unhappy. And um, I came to that place of like, wow, I can't get myself out of this. Either I'm gonna die or I'm gonna reach out to Jesus and see if he is who people say he is. At 20, he decided it was time to stop running. Got in my room and 
I opened up that Bible that my sister gave me, and it was like the words were just leaping off the pages. And I knew it was God. My heart just broken, just calling out to Jesus. If you are who they say you are, I need you. And in that moment, it was like the whole atmosphere shifted in the room. Just his love poured into my heart. It was very, very tangible. The fear, the depression, the hopelessness just was just evaporated. I thought, this is better than drugs. And I remember hearing the voice of the Lord uh, for the first time very, very clearly. And he said to me, son, I have plans for your life. Michael couldn't wait to tell his parents he had given his life to Christ. He told me that he had this amazing encounter with God and, and uh, just weeping, You're just so happy. It's beautiful, you know, just beautiful. God answered all our prayers. Inside of me was jumping up inside out, you know, and I knew God was going to use him. Michael says with God's strength, he was able to clean up every area of his life. Then in 2012, he graduated from Christ for the Nations Institute and began working overseas as a missionary. There, he met his wife, Selena. Today, they are still active in ministry and are raising a family together. I always thought God is about following rules and religious rituals and things, but no, it really is about a vibrant relationship with a loving Father through Son, Jesus Christ. Don't give up on your loved ones because God sees every tear. He sees you, he hears your prayers. With God, all things are possible. It doesn't matter how deep, how dark, uh, it doesn't matter what you've done in your life. He's there with open arms. Boy, I so relate to both sides of this story. I relate to Michael because, you know, you hit your teen years and you just feel so full of yourself. You feel like the world is, you're there for you and you can have what you want. You just try to get what you want in every means that you can. And I, I think Michael hit the nail on the head where he said, every time I got what I wanted, I came up empty. You know, it's an interesting thing, isn't it? That you can spend every bit of effort that you have, every amount of talent that you have, every bit of money that you have, every connection that you have, and you come up empty. You know, living life that way versus living your life with the Lord is just opposite ends of the spectrum. Over here, striving, 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 coming up empty. Over here, a life of intention and purpose that was always to be yours from the beginning. And then I really relate to Mr. and Mrs. Lombardo as well. You know, as a parent, I, I've been there myself where you're watching your child make poor mistake, poor choice after poor choice after poor choice. And you say, what do I do, God? And you begin to pray and you wait and you pray and you wait and you pray and you feel like it's never going to change. And then one day, that's an amazing thing, isn't it? That someone so lost as Michael was in a moment, in a moment. You see, a moment with Jesus is unbelievable. It's miraculous. It's life changing. It's, it's character changing. How is it that a young kid who's drinking, doing drugs, having sex, belligerent to his parents, out breaking the law, doing his own thing, in a moment, his life changed? That's the way it is in Scripture, too. Every time Jesus came in touch with someone who encountered him with a very real situation, in a moment, their life was changed. You know, as you listen to this story, as you watch what went on with this family, maybe you're somebody who has been looking and looking. You've tried everything. You've, you've done it all, and you come up empty. Your life can change in a moment, not because of you, but because of Jesus. He's the one who created you with intention and purpose. He's the one who has waited patiently. It's his spirit that has hounded you. The Holy Spirit is sometimes called the hound of heaven because he comes after us. 
You know, scripture says that the good shepherd leaves the 99 to go after the one who's lost. Are you the one who's lost today? Because if you are, Jesus has come after you. Stop, just stop all your straining for success, straining for friendship, straining for relationships, straining for finances, straining for position, straining for favor. Stop and do what Michael did. Just get down on your knees. Say, God, I'm done. I'm just done. I want you. I want what you've got for me, Jesus. I have so blown it. Forgive my sins. They are so deep. I don't even know where to begin to confess them, but I know you know them all. So I'm giving it all to you. Everything I've done and the attitude in my heart that has been against you and that has allowed me to do these things and hurt others. I'm giving it all to you. I surrender. I'm asking you to be the savior of my soul, the Lord of my life. I'm giving it all to you. Now teach me your ways. Come, Holy Spirit, fill my mind, fill my heart. Show me how to live for you, with you, in you. I want you. I want heaven. And I thank you for forgiveness, God. Thank you for waiting for me. And I'm praying this in Jesus' name. If you ask the creator of the universe for this with sincerity, it is done now. Believe that. You might have something in your life that's really troubling and you say, where do I go with this? Call our toll-free line because there's someone waiting to pray for you today. By the way, what do you do now? A new day. This is a packet Pat's put together just for you, filled with wonderful information and the word of God. How do you follow Jesus? It's yours for free. So is the toll-free number, 1-800-700-7000. So call now. We'll send it out to you right away. Time for a Monday round of your questions and Pat's honest answers. <laughs> Pat, the first question comes from Anita, who says, I try to live my life with moral boundaries. I've been praying to God that he bring me a companion to marry to share my life with. I'm 57 years old, but the men I've talked to on social media just try to get with me for sex. The single Christian men I've known don't seem interested in a relationship with any woman. I'm tempted to give up on getting with anybody. What can I do besides pray? Well, I, I think in a sense, you know, you remember Willie Sutton, he said, how come you rob banks? Well, that's where the money is. I think you ought to go. They do have singles meeting in, in some churches where people who, you know, love the Lord get together. And I, I think, you know, the Bible says God will put the single people in families and the, the, all the families are named after God, who's the author of all of them. So God will answer your prayer. Just, you know, but as I say, begin to go where the potentials are who would be appropriate for you. And there's a program, I think, isn't it called Christian Singles? There's something out there. I don't, I don't really Well, there know used to be one. I don't know if it's still in, in operation or not, but there's something out there. All right. This is Aaron who says, how do I know when God is telling me to do something? How do I know it's not just something I came up with? Well, the Bible says, he that is the mature are those who through reason of use have their senses exercised that they might discern good and evil. Uh, I think there isn't any substitute for practice. There isn't any substitute for having experience. So I recommend that you practice the presence of God. Ask God to show you something. If you miss him, you go back some more. It's like a little kid starting to walk. You don't beat him up because he falls down every so often. God knows that you're like a baby and and he's trying to look for you, but that's how you find out by reason of use, having your senses exercised, okay? This is Janae who says, I've been reading Revelations, and if you take the mark of the beast, you can't buy or sell, and it will make it a challenge to eat. I'm going to refuse the mark of the beast, but if I have a family member that accepts the mark of the beast and they buy groceries, am I allowed to eat their food? Look. For heaven's sakes, you're not living in the book of Revelation, and we don't have the Antichrist, and we don't have the, where's the mark of the beast? Is it in Walmart? I mean, that's just ridiculous. 
of course, go buy groceries and eat what you want to, you know. But she's saying scripturally, it says that day will come. So. Yeah, well, the day hadn't come yet, so don't worry about it. It's not here right now. It probably won't, won't be. So don't worry. Before anything like that happens, the Lord's going to take care of you. Live your life. The only thing that you don't do is if, if, if somebody uh, is going to be tempted by your activities, Paul said, if my freedom will cause somebody else to sin, I'll eat no meat while the world stands. But that has to do with meat offered to idols. It has nothing to do with being sold at Whole Foods, all right? Okay, this is Jerry who says, Hi, Pat. Jesus said in Matthew 11, 28 through 30, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and humble, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What is Jesus' yoke that is easy and what is his burden that is light? What does Jesus mean? <laughs> well, the whole concept is, is a, a bunch of oxen. They, they've got a yoke. And the two of them pulled together. And so Jesus said, you join with me and let me pull the burden. And uh, once upon the Lord said to me, he said, this is my work. I'll carry the burden. And I think that's what he's talking about. He, he, his yoke is, is team up with him. And yes, he has work for us to do, but he will carry the burden. But that's a take my yoke upon you. Uh, it's, it's team up with me. That's what a yoke is, a couple of oxen. They've got a yoke together, all right? This is Lauren who says, what does the Bible mean when it says to, quote, work out your salvation with fear and trembling? Well, he goes on to say, for it's God that works in you both the will and the do of his good pleasure. So he, the idea is we work like it all depends on us. We pray as if it all depends on God. And it's a balance between the two of them, all right? Colleen asks, I've got saved, or I got saved through the 700 Club 40 years ago, and I praise God for your ministry. My question is, how could such a perfect God create such an imperfect world? If God could see the end from the beginning, why would he continue with us knowing how <laughs> awful things would turn out? Well, if you go back in the beginning, uh, uh, at creation, there was something called the anointed cherub that covers uh, he said he was perfect in all his way till iniquities found, was found in him. So God created everything perfect, but pride came in, and the anointed cherub, Satan, began to look at his own splendor, and he said, I can do it better than God. And that is the original sin. I can do it my way. You know those songs, I did it my way? Well, that is the original sin. And how did it come about? Well, it's because God made man with free will, and he made Satan with free will. And so having seen that go, he, he didn't destroy them as he could have, but he allows it to work out until such time as a perfect man came on the scene, lived a perfect life, and then died on a cross for all of us. And that just, even as one man, Adam, sinned, and all became sinners, even so one man, Jesus Christ, died that all might be perfected in God. So God's got it all together, and he's redeeming the world, and the redemption is far better than anything we've ever experienced. Terry? Well, that's all the time we have for today. Oh, Thank boy. You. No more questions. <laughs> <laughs> He's rejoicing. <laughs> well, Jia Yi is a budding young artist who spends lots of time drawing, but she lives in a world of silence. Why? This child was born deaf with little hope of ever being able to hear. Jiayi loves to draw with her sister. She likes green. I like blue. Every time Jiayi finishes a picture, she points to it for our approval. And we say, it's awesome. But Jia Yi has never been able to hear any of her grandparents' compliments because she's deaf. The doctor said she couldn't hear unless you faced her and shouted as loud as a train horn. Both of Jia Yi's parents are permanently deaf. So Grandpa and Grandpa Lee took over raising Jia Yi and her sister. I couldn't teach her much of anything. I didn't even finish elementary school, so it was really difficult. 
My sister didn't know what my grandmother was saying, so I was her little helper. She and her grandma used gestures with Jiayi, but no one outside of the family could communicate with her. Children didn't play with Jiayi or share their toys because she couldn't talk. She just started playing along with her teddy bear. Her grandparents encouraged her to draw more during this time. I hoped that Jiayi could develop a skill and achieve something in the future. We wanted people to respect her. Meanwhile, Jiayi's uncle gave her some used hearing aids. They didn't work well, and Jiayi was always at risk of getting hurt. Once she ran the wrong way and got hit, I shouted at her, but she couldn't hear me. She was in the hospital for more than two weeks, and it took a couple of months to finally recover from her injuries. Every morning, Grandpa Lee prayed for Jiayi. I prayed that the Lord would restore her hearing. Then a teacher told the Lees about CBN, and we gave Jiayi brand new hearing aids. Today, she's learning to speak. There was a big change. Now she can hear low sounds clearly. She even told us this new hearing aid is good. She loves to talk and is at the top of her class. I really believe that she will become an artist for the glory of God. And when she does, it will be you 700 Club members that she can say thank you to because you listened to the heart of God and you reached out to touch and to help children and families in need. We want to say thank you. You know, 700 Club members are doing this kind of life-changing, life-altering work all around the country every day. They're, the sun never sets on CBN's work 24-7, and that's because of your generosity and your kindness and compassion for others. To the rest of you, if you watch this program and you've not yet joined the 700 Club, today would be a great day to do it. 65 cents a day, $20 a month makes you a 700 Club member, and you even do that by calling a toll-free number. It's one 800 700 7000. Just call and say, I want to join the 700 Club, and we welcome you to the outreach that's going on around the world from this place. Our way of saying thank you to you for caring about others is to send you this God is for us. Pat is reading verses of salvation, peace, and victory from the book of Romans with some beautiful music behind it. And it's really very inspiring. In fact, Michael, who lives in Wichita, Kansas, already has been listening to his. He says, I loved God is for us. It answered many questions about salvation and victory. I feel more empowered when I hear the word of God. Well, we all are. And that's one of the reasons we're making this available to you. So join now, change someone else's life. And at the same time, we believe your life will be blessed with this gift. In case you wondered, you're watching the 700 Club. We're so happy to have you with us. We've got some miracle stories for you today. So get ready to be blessed. Constant pain. That's what plagued Kathy Havilon 24-7. Medication didn't ease her agony, and when she had surgery, it only made her worse. So how did Kathy finally get relief right in her own recliner? Take a look. In the summer of 2018, Kathy Haviland underwent surgery to remove a polyp and part of her colon. For two years, it gave her no problems until one day in July, 2020. All of a sudden, I was getting this, every time I got up in the morning, I'd have this terrible pain in my stomach, and it would linger most of the day. The pain was so bad, Kathy often needed her husband's assistance with day-to-day -day tasks. My husband had to help a lot because bending over hurt, lifting anything that was like a gallon of water or anything like that, it would be painful. No matter how much help she had or how careful she tried to be, Kathy was in constant pain. I said, there's something not right. Finally, she went to her doctor, who told Kathy the procedure she had had in 2018 had caused what she called a surgical hernia. A couple of years later, that whole area became hardened, kind of, and it was, it was very painful. And dangerous. She told Kathy she needed to see a surgeon immediately to have it evaluated. They suggested that I have it repaired before it became an emergency. 
Soon after, Kathy went in for outpatient surgery and was home the same day. By the next morning when I tried to get up, it was very painful again. Trying to sit up hurt a lot. I had to hold my stomach in to be able to sit up and to stand up then. And I stayed in the recliner most of the time. By August 4th, four days after surgery, Kathy was still in constant pain despite taking pain medications. That morning, as usual, Kathy started her daily prayer time. I, you know, just call on him. The first thing I say is Jesus. I love being in his presence and just hearing what he has to say. And like she often does, she also turned on the 700 Club. Pat and Wendy were giving words of knowledge. There's, I think a woman, but you've had something with your abdomen, somebody, uh, it, it, it may have been that you, you had a, a birth that was uh, it was surgery on your abdomen with the, something about your abdominal muscles. Put your hand on your abdomen right now in the name of Jesus. Touch them. Amen. Thank you, Lord. When he said that, I just felt such a peace come over me. And I um, the pain started to subside right away. And by the next morning, it was so much better. <laughs> Since then, Kathy has been pain-free, and life has returned to normal. That is just wonderful. It's like, you know, it just reminded me all I need is one word from God sometimes for, for the miracle to happen. <laughs> I say, isn't God good? I, I didn't know Kathy. I didn't know about her surgery. I didn't know anything about her, but God knew her. God knows you. He knows who you are, where you are, and what's your problems. And the thing is that the Lord who made you can also fix you. Here's one in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, somebody named Joe, 82 years old, broke her foot. And she was suffering from weakness in her foot and tendons. She was watching this program, and she heard Terry say, your foot drops. It affects your walk, your stability, everything. God is repairing those ligaments and muscles and everything that needs to be restored will be perfectly whole. And Joe said, that's for me. The next day she was able to bend and turn her foot and she's had no pain working in her garden. That's wonderful, Amen. isn't it? Freedom. Yeah. This is Samina who lives in Frisco, Texas. She wasn't finding any relief for the arthritis in her knee. She was watching this program on August 3rd of this year. And Pat, she heard you say, give a word of knowledge for those with arthritic pain. And when you said you will no longer feel the crippling effects, Samina believed God for her knee. She received instant healing. She hasn't had any pain since then. Praise Amen. God. Mm -hmm. Now, folks, we're going to pray for you, and I believe in God. I believe in the Lord. He said, hitherto you've asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you shall receive. So we're going to join hands. We're going to believe God for you, and I, all I can ask you to do is just believe God with us. Mm -hmm. Father, in Jesus' name, may the anointing power of the Holy Spirit rest upon us. Somebody has emphysema. It's really been bad. Put your hand on your chest in the name of Jesus. George, touch him. Terry. Yeah, there's someone else. You've had some surgery, and there you have this contraption called a halo that's been put on you. Oh God is healing your condition right now. Everything that has been a problem in the past is gone now. In Jesus' name, be healed. There's some people who have broken limbs, mm. breaks in your legs, yes. your arms, fractures, compound fractures, regular fractures. Right now, God is just moving in this audience and he's healing bones. They're actually coming together and there's dramatic healing in the name of Jesus. Terry? You know, someone else, you've had gastric bypass surgery and it's not only left you with a lot of pain, but it hasn't really been effective like it's supposed to be. God is healing that for you. Not just that, he's healing the condition that caused you to have this in the first place. So receive that now in Jesus' name. Uh, there's somebody, uh, is the name of Till, uh, you, you're, you're choking up, you're having constriction in your throat, and you're having a hard time swallowing. Just touch your, your throat, and God has just opened that up, and you, you're completely healed in Jesus' name. Now, Father, again, we pray for those people in Afghanistan. We think of these young girls and these women who are being under the, the heel of that awful Taliban, 
God, reach out there and rescue. They're crying out for mercy right now. Move among them. Do a miracle. We know, Lord, that we have failed as a nation, but, Lord, you never fail. So Jesus. we ask for them now in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. And amen. Well, I guess that's all the time we've got. Thank you so much. Give us a call. Let us hear from you what the Lord has done. And uh, we leave you now with these words from the book of Romans. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Well, tomorrow, double pneumonia and sepsis caused by COVID-19. Oh, the man came back from the brink. So for Terry and all of us, we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.